Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2, where John Coleman and I have the pleasure of speaking with John Mariani, of the vir who is the virtual gourmet. Hi, John. Yeah. Hi, John. Hello. The embodiment of the virtual gourmet right in front of us. Hey, John, a couple of weeks ago, um, I don't remember when, but we were talking about Dublin, your trip to mm. Ireland, your recent trip to Ireland. And um, interestingly enough, I watch a couple of uh, Irish TV shows on, uh, you know, streaming video uh, series. And it seems to me that uh, D Dublin is always featured and it's the dock, a big canal, a docks area. Is that the, is that a she-she kind of place to be in Dublin? Is that where a lot of restaurants are and things to see? It's become, well, it'd like to be she-she at the moment, uh, as in London's docklands, uh, Dublin's docklands have been converted with bank buildings, all made out of aluminum and glass. Um, and there are some hotels and there are some good restaurants, which I'd be happy to speak about over there. But uh, generally, um, on both sides of the Liffey River, which is a wide river, pretty broad river, which runs to the center of town. Um, it's not, I wouldn't call it shishi, but it's it's the new and developing section, which the north side of the river really needed, because that was the that was yeah. the poor side of the city. That's where James Joyce lived. And as soon as he could get out, got out and never returned. <laughs> uh, it's a strange thing about the great Irish writers, James, James Joyce, uh, Brendan B, and um, so many of them who, uh, Oscar Wilde, uh, who got out of town when the getting was good because it wasn't a very nice place to live, um, not only because of poverty, but because uh, the dominance, the overwhelming dominance of the Catholic Church, which made it difficult for anybody to live a life that had any pleasure in it whatsoever uh, outside of drinking. Um, so uh, James Joyce was one of them, and um, he cursed the city horribly. If he showed up today, or if Oscar Wilde came back and checked into the Sherburne Ho Shelburne Hotel or, or Padraic Pierce or Brennan, they'd find it a lively, vital, wonderful, colorful city, uh, unimaginable, even 30 years ago, before the Celtic Tiger um, roared in the early part of this century. And that was a rec an economic reclamation of daunting proportions, but again, being led by the bankers and the developers, it all crashed uh, terribly in 2008 and took some time to recover. And then COVID set back um, everything, uh, but most specifically the tourist industry, which uh, Dublin and Ireland depends upon for, as, it's, as its main industry, and Americans being the most tourists composed, composed the most tourists who go over by the hundreds of thousands each year. I mean, just take away just the Americans, forget about everybody else who wants to visit Ireland, the Japanese, the Chinese, and so forth, who also love it. Um, take that away, and uh, you're, it's a devastating blow, which has now come back. When I was there in uh, April, uh, tourism was, was up probably back about 25%, but wow. a lot of restaurants that were jammed at uh, 7 o'clock, 7.30, and um, we're jammed until 9.30, 10 o'clock. The yeah. pub is still doing well. Um, the music is back in the pub, so it's it's a very good time to, to go. Now, John, um, Dublin is a historic city, one of the oldest cities uh, in the world. It's, it's, I'm told, a beautiful city. Where does one go other than, I don't know, to see James Joyce's house? What, what does one do? What are the sights to see in Dublin? Well, when you come into town, uh, whether it's by train or by air from Shannon Airport, Dublin Airport, um, which is now a very modern airport. Um, first of all, I should say getting out of it, if you are an American, they've long had this um, um, deal where you go through customs and security, New York customs, in Dublin. So you go through there, so when you get off the plane, uh, you get off and you just walk right out as if you just came came off a plane from Cleveland. It's terrific. But going in is easy. Um, as I said, because of tourism, is it's not high, uh, getting through customs and such. They're very friendly people. The Irish always have this great wit. So you go into town 
and you check into any number of, of hotels or B&Bs uh, anywhere in Central. The central thing to know about Dublin is it's quite small. It's probably about the size of Boston. And anyone who knows Boston knows you can walk around it and see all the sites within two, three days. You go on the Freedom Trail in Boston, you see Paul Revere's uh, the, the Old North Church and Tremont Street and so forth, and boom, you're done. Um, in Dublin, that's very, very much the same. After about three days, you'll want to go on to uh, other uh, other places in uh, Ireland, um, which are also worth seeing. And one of these days, on one of the shows, we'll talk about Galway. So what do you go there to see? Well, you don't kiss the Blarney Stone, because that's nowhere near Dublin. Um, <laughs> what you want to see is, uh, first of all, uh, St. Uh, Paul's Church, uh, I'm sorry, St. Saint Saint Stephen's Church, which is where Jonathan Swift was once pastor um, back in the ninth, back in the 18th century. Um, lovely, lovely place. You want to go to the National Museum, which has very, very fine art, specifically um, Irish art. Um, Trinity College is kind of like, um, well, it's very much like Harvard and Yale and Columbia, smack dab in the middle of the city, You're walking down Nassau Street and boom, all of a sudden there's this great college. Um, it's a beautiful square. Oscar Wilde went there. Uh, George Bernard Shaw went there. Uh, he's another expatriate, by the way. Um, and it's a beautiful campus, very friendly people. Now, right now, you can also visit on campus what is called the long room of the uh, library, Trinity College Library, which is an extraordinary piece of architecture with like 50 foot ceilings stacked with old books. It's just gorgeous. And it also has there the Book of Kells, which is a medieval manuscript. Yeah. And they turn one page per day, all illuminated in very special conditions. Um, uh, as of October, that's all going to be shut down for uh, renovation which could take two or three years because I haven't done it in a long time. The place is a tinder house of, of wood, the library. And uh, so all of that has to be protected. But if you go between now and October, you should be good. Um, there is one of the must sees is the Guinness uh, Museum and Storehouse. Uh, Guinness dominates uh, Ireland, per se, and specifically Dublin, where they began. Uh, and the, they have done a state-of-the-art museum with uh, videos and, and, and li live uh, presentations, uh, not just of the Guinness story, but of its importance to Irish culture. And there's music and everything. And then you end up on the top floor where the Guinness flows at this big bar uh, goes around 360 degrees overlooking all of Dublin. Uh, not far away is the Irish Whiskey Museum. And if the Irish have produced anything other than great literature, it's uh, Guinness and Irish whiskey, which is um, it's actually my whiskey of choice. I, I wouldn't say I prefer it to scotch, but I uh, find it a little lighter than scotch um, and easier to uh, drink. Um, everybody probably knows a little bit about the Irish re rebellion on Easter Sunday, 1916, when they tried to overthrow the British who had been there for four or five hundred years at that point. Um, a sad chapter in uh, Irish history. Um, and the 1960 rebellion was a complete flop. But its history is told in the bullet holes that you will find in some of the buildings that were being defended or attacked. And whereas the British soldiers, soldiers uh, holed up in the Shelburne Hotel and shot down at them into St. Stephen's uh, Green, um, the post office which is a beautiful post office over on the north side, is where the uh, Irish rebel rebellion, uh, Irish rebels, they uh, were defending themselves there when the British uh, uh, came in. So there's history written all over uh, the city. There's also, um, I've mentioned this before, I believe the Magdalene Laundry is one of the few, just a building now. Magdalene Laundry was this horrible, there's no, no other way to describe it except it was slavery for young girls, wayward girls, prostitutes, girls who got pregnant, even girls whose parents thought they were flirty. They'd be sent to the Magdalene laundries overseen by um, the Sisters of Mercy. Huh, was that a misnomer? 
who enslaved <laughs> in these laundries to do all of the laundry for the various Paris missions around Ireland. And there were hundreds of them at one point. The last one only closed in 1996. There was a wow. fierce movie made about it um, um, and also a documentary. And Joni Mitchell's absolutely stunning song on the Magdalene Laundries, which you should listen to. Um, so you, they're turning that into a museum. So you will be able to go inside and see the conditions that these girls, uh, uh, who are also sexually abused by the, the parish priests and, and, and so forth. It's a horrible story. But it is part of a, uh, a dominating influence in Catholicism that the Irish are only now really living up to. So other than that, walking the streets of, of Dublin to visit the cheesemongers, uh, to visit um, my favorite haberdasher where you can get Donegal tweeds at uh, Kevin Howland's on Nassau Street, um, the fish and ships, chips, <laughs> excuse me, I get them in tight, the fish and chips shops um, where you get terrific fish and chips. One of my favorites, which is called the hairy lemon, um, <laughs> which has nothing to do with a hairy lemon except for a guy who used to be a, uh, a, a rat catcher or something, and they, his ugly face, hairy face, and they call him hairy lemon. Um, but it's a really, really nice place with a cheery yellow facade. The streets are clean, the streets are narrow. Now, who wheeled her wheelbarrow through the streets? Oh, oh you're, you're asking me who? Why, wait, was it? Wait, Molly Malone. Molly? Oh, yeah. And Molly's statue is at the end of uh, the street there in. And oh, really? They have a statue for her? Yes, they do, right on Grafton Street, and you can see old Molly, who is uh, fictional, of course. Um, yeah. You can see statues of Parnell. You will see statues of of uh, James Joyce leaning on a walking stick um, on Connell, uh, Connell Street. Um, there's wonderful, wonderful things like that uh, all over town. I mean, it's a very historic place. But even if you're not that interested in history, as I said, there's great food, and we'll, we'll be talking about that in another segment um where we talked about the great food that's there we talk about where to eat this great food in the in the next segment that we do so um it's just a complete and friendly oh by the way you don't have to speak another language although the way the irish in dublin speak uh english can be a little rough um the lower the class uh, i was gonna say if you've, if you've met a true irishman you you might wonder if it's the same language you're speaking yeah well they sound the way you sound when you're trying to do an Irish brogue. <laughs> My bad Irish brogue, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would love to go to Ireland and try my Irish brogue and get from the Irish people that look like, who the, what the, who, what the, who is that? Yeah, I probably think you're from Australia or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's great fun pretending to be Irish. Uh, actually, I am Irish, uh, part Irish, one one millionth Irish, something like that. John, uh, you certainly every time I read the virtual gourmet, I think I've told you this before. You make me want to get on a plane and go somewhere. Your descriptions are uh, well; they're not only accurate, but they're enticing. They're they're um, they're fun, fun descriptions, and obviously, it's just as much fun talking to you about uh, your experiences there. Um, I really I really want to go see Dublin, particularly. One last question for you. And it, you mentioned that Dublin's a small city and Ireland's not that big. Um, is it, does, when one goes to Dublin, do you do day trips outside of Dublin to places? Oh, very, very easy. Yeah, they have a very good transport system. The trains do run on time. Um, and uh, you hop from there, hop right on a, a, a train to the station. You could be in any of, oh, 15, 20 cities within an hour, and you go all the way to the coast to, like, Galway, that's two and a half hours, so it's very easy to do. You could, I mean, you could literally go to the Galway, as I did, for two days and be back in Dublin the next day. It's, it's yeah. uh, just great. You never have to hop on a plane, certainly. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like a wonderful place. Um, all right, so next, uh, not next time, but soon, we're going to talk about Galway. I yeah. think I have relatives 150 years ago who came from Galway. And uh, next time, let's talk about the restaurants in uh, Dublin, because we've talked a lot about Dublin, 
Um, and we talked about the food and the hotels, hotels, and the, yeah. the cooking, but not the restaurants. I want to, I want to hear more about the Harry Lemon. <laughs> Is that a restaurant? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next time. Thanks, John. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.